did it. Can everybody see that? Can you all see that screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. I, I just find it so amazing that I can be sitting in my living room talking to all of you from all over the place. And it makes me so happy that though we're cut off from everyone, we can still be together too. So it, it's wonderful. And that's the one, that's the door that was opened up with this pandemic. We have learned other ways to connect without having to spread our germs around. So I'm really happy to be here with you to talk about what a garden means to me. It means so much. These are my little baby hummers that I probably photographed 50 times a day. This is just before they fledged, but I had to start this off with them. And you may be thinking, and Jeff, it won't advance. You may be thinking, what's a California gardener doing talking to the Austin gardeners? Well, I have what's called clay Diablo soil, and you have clay gumbo. I have 96% clay and 4% loam. Hold on. Jeff's trying to fix this. This has never done this. So those of you who are with me on Facebook and Instagram know that I spend a lot of time in my nightgown and my robe because I garden in my nightgown every day and I do work in my nightgown. And I go outside armed with my sturdy spoon. And I'll tell you about that. That's for my, my bug patrol. And I, I love this poem from John Ray, who was up from the 1600s, 1665. I like to go out on a walk and with each plant and flower talk. And that's what I do every day. And that's what I hope you get to do is go out and talk to your flowers and your plants. And I really honestly believe that they understand that we love them and they respond to our love. I have, I have, when I first started gardening, when I was young, I planted all my ranunculus and other bulbs upside down. And I loved them so much and they all just twisted around and came up. And I think love is a powerful thing to help us grow. I want to advance. Hold on. Tap that. I have to say, I had to send you that because I often think maybe I should get out more often instead of living in my robe. So you're going to hear my thoughts and I'm an opinionated gardener and I'm not ashamed of that. I think we have a right to be eccentric as heck. And I think that especially as organic gardeners, a lot of us are eccentric. We have our weird things that we do, they work and we're not out grabbing the insecticide can and the rodenticide and all the other sides that I don't approve of but we've figured out other ways to work in tandem with a healthy garden. And I think a lazy gardener is one of the best friends of wildlife. And I've found that if I'm out in the garden, I have this, I'm kind of overly zealous about keeping things clean sometimes. I'll actually pull leaves off of a tree when they're almost ready to fall because I just rake the path. But what I've found is that when I leave certain areas kind of wild, kind of overgrown with lots of seed heads on it all during the winter. I'll get the, the goldfinches and the white crown sparrows and the, all the birds coming in to pick bugs off of the plants and to pick the seeds off of them. So it's not a bad thing to be a lazy gardener once in a while. This is another one of my opinions. Just, I'm so over those, be gone. I wanna take you through the garden gate. This is, this is actually a gate that my friend Freeland Tanner built. And just to show you some neat things that you can do, he just used some old tools. He made the framework, he affixed the tools to the frame and he has kind of a signature green, he has a signature green and a signature blue color that he uses in his garden. And I just think this is splendid. So come on into the garden with me. And I believe that no matter where you live and no, unless you're, I guess, in the Arctic circle and then there's probably ways to do it there too you can garden. And I started gardening when I was a kid. I gardened in beer cans, tomato sauce cans. I planted pine seeds from Green Valley. I dug up oaks. I learned how deep their roots are. And in Maine, we have, um, this is just to show you, see if I can get my laser pointer to work. It won't work. It won't work. Okay. That's all right. That's where we live in Maine. And even though we're right on the ocean, we're able to have pretty wonderful garden and all the lettuces and 
and broccoli and mustards and all sorts of edibles so we could just walk out on the porch. What did I use for food and fertilizer and soil? I, I used bagged soils because of, it's pretty wild there. You can see that it's a lot of ledge. And um, I used a lot of seaweed, which I gathered and washed and used as my mulch. And it was a very prolific garden. And here in California, I know how dense Austin is because I've done a lot of work in Austin and I, uh, I love going to Central Texas Gardener, love my excuse to go to, to Austin. And, but I live in a very dense area too. I'm a country girl or what you call the hick but I live in the city and my house is where the red dot is. You can see that we are just a, just a, a spaghetti bowl of roads. And actually my house is right there on the corner and it's the only really green patch of land around here because this is mostly student. In the last 15 years, this has totally changed and it's mostly student housing. And so what do students not do? They're good at drinking beer. They're great at throwing parties, even in the middle of a pandemic, but they're not so good at watering the lawn or watering their garden. And I don't really blame them because they have to pay the water bill. I, however, use my fair share of water and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So when I moved here, it was the house, as you could see, was right on the street. So the first thing we did was um, I pan planted a pomegranate and we planted about 70 fruit trees. This is a nine to 10,000 square foot lot. So you know it's not big. So here's the street right here. And within three months, this is what it looked like. We built a six foot wall. I had gone to the cloisters. I don't know if you've gone to the cloisters in New York. And I was so inspired by the cloisters and seeing the white walls and how happy the fruits are espaliered against the hot walls. And I have just had the best fruit output from any of the things growing against these walls are protected from the wind and they get great sun. So this is what was in my side yard when I moved here. It was a lawn and you know, I don't use any, any insecticides or anything. This lawn was so poisoned, I'm sure that if a worm ever happened to get into this area, it would have died and rolled over immediately. And within three or four months, this is what it looked like. We took up the lawn, we brought in soil now you have gumbo, you have those three different soil profiles that you have in the Austin area. And I have 96% clay, 4% um, loam, Diablo clay, perfect name for it. And uh, we brought in truckloads of soil. And then I'll show you how we also make our own soil here. So we, we did not do anything, we covered the lawn, we did not dig it up. I just don't like to destroy the soil. I don't like to destroy, disturb the microbes, the mycelium and things in the soil. I like to leave it pretty untouched. So as I did in my gardens in Cambria, California, where we had our teaching gardens and we had 100,000 visitors a year. We were right by close to Hearst Castle and we had 100,000 by actual receipt of visitors a year. Um, we built up the soil from the ground up. We raised the bed six, eight, 10 inches, and that makes a world of difference. That's all we needed to do. This was the side by my studio, by Mockingbird Studio, and it was mud, and it was jade plant and pittosporum and an overgrown uh, pepper tree that was quite diseased. It had very bad um, scale, and I'm afraid of scale. Um, it takes a lot of attention. And so within three months, this is what it looked like. How like a well-kept garden is your soul? Baudelaire. It is true. Sadly, my garden is not as well-kept as it could be because I'm so weird about cutting things. Trimming. Nothing that comes in my house goes to waste. Anything that we eat, newspapers, uh, cardboard, paper towels, we don't have a, uh, we don't have a um, garbage disposal. We've never had a garbage disposal. It all goes into the red can that you see right there and it all gets added to the worm bin and it is turned into soil. So nothing is wasted here. 
you can go out and you can buy yourself a worm bin. I mean, I'd love to know how many of you do vermicomposting. I, I can't really imagine life without vermicomposting, which sounds pretty corny, but it's true. You can do this kind of a vermicomposting kit or do what I did in my garden. Well, Jeff had a great parking place here. This was in Cambria where we lived for 25 years. And I saw that his parking place had the best sound, the best sunshine on the whole lot. So Jeff donated his parking space, donated it not willingly, but it turned into a beautiful garden. Again, nothing was touched, even though it was red rock underneath. And that is just like having an asphalt driveway. We just added to the topsoil and we kept adding and adding. And we outlined the beds with river rock and just six or eight inches is an amazing thing. For the trees and things, we did have to make it uh, higher mounds, but we did great. And what you're seeing with the yellow, uh, what the yellow arrows pointing to is our worm bin. And I give plans for this in trial and error, my organic gardening book, but you should be able to get that book at the library easily. Um, and when we moved to the city, we we took a shady area and we used one of the, how big is that? Two by four. It's two by four um, watering trough. And Jeff poked little smaller than worm sized holes in the bottom so the worms would not try to be liberated. And we filled it with kitchen uh, waste and with newspapers that are wet. He built a box around it to keep the sun from blazing in on it and, and burning them or hurting them. And that's, um, that's tea that you're looking at there in the bucket on the left, that's worm pea, um, which is wonderful. And let me let you look in, it has a lid that fits. One day he, he went, before he got the lid on, he went, oh, you did have the lid on. It wasn't fitting that well. He lifted the lid up to dump in our morning's garbage. And there was about a three foot gopher snake curled up in there, probably pretty happy because we had mice in it before we had a tight fitting lid. We put all our kitchen garbage in here, uh, one half one week, one half the next week. And then we harvest from the half that's had a week to wait. And it is amazing how quickly it breaks down. And these are my girls. I know they're not girls, but it's just easier when you're at a restaurant to say, may I have a to-go bag to take some things home to my girls? You don't want to say, could I have a to-go bag to take things home to my worms? What I, I got a question, Jeff is reading it to me. He's gonna be my helper here. What do you do with your meat scraps? For a while, I put them in my worm bin and I covered the worm bin. I put in the meat scraps, chicken bones and everything and they did get cleaned up, but I got maggots. And I know that maggots are not bad. They, are, they can clean wounds, they can do all sorts of good things, but there's just something so gross about lifting up your worm bin lid and seeing, all these maggots wiggling around. I just couldn't take it. So now my um, any scraps of things go into my freezer bags because I use it for making soups. And it seems like when I use it for making soups and they simmer and they get off the bone and everything, it seems to me that they don't get maggots like they did when they went in fresh. I give my worms everything except they don't like corn on the cob. They do not know how to process that cob. And yet in Sweden and different places, they're giving them styrofoam. They're giving them styrofoam pellets and they're, they're digesting those styrofoam pellets and sadly pooping out small pieces of styrofoam, but they're trying to figure out, you know, how do you get rid of all these contaminants on the earth? And worms are a great way to handle so much garbage, wet cardboard, wet newspapers, wet letters, wet envelopes, I don't put um, shiny junk mail in it because I feel like that's not good to get all those color chemicals on them. So I don't do that, but this is the best tool we ever bought. Uh, I'm gonna take a sip of water here. Um, this is the best tool we ever bought. What's our horsepower on that? We have, it's a seven horsepower, um, a seven horsepower engine. And you can see the pile of debris that we have a few times a week we have that much. And then if you look, that little teeny bit of green at the base of the of the shredder grinder is our pile of debris. And then I just put it on the beds. It's wonderful. I call this my genius bar. It's really my potting area. And you can see um, on the right side, there are all kinds of whisks and spoons and 
different things. I use chopsticks to poke holes for small seedlings. I use pencils to plant seeds. I use a big spoon to whack bugs off of plants and I hold a, a big bucket of soapy water underneath them. Um, so this is where I do a lot of my experiments and everything that I have, for instance, in any of my books, it's all been tried out on my husband <laughs> and my son and they're still alive and they still like me. And um, uh, I really go to, uh, when I'm doing my, diff my different blends and things for organic gardening, I go to the Biointegral Resource Center. I go to Texas A&M. I go to UC Davis. I go to the University of Florida. I go to the and Cornell. I go to the best schools. I go to the. Um, I look at the bibliographies in books like the Olkowski book and Common Sense Pest Control, and I go back into the bi bibliography and the science. Today, I watched something from Texas, and it was somebody spraying a plant with neem oil in the middle of a hot day. I just want to tell you. None of these sprays and things that you make, even though they're benign in many ways, can be sprayed in the middle of a hot day because you'll hurt your plants. Test them out on a few plants. Don't use them uh, at top strength, like the, the Tabasco sauce. I use that for many things. So don't use that on a hot day, just a warning. So in, in uh, trial and error, I have a thing about, you know, using easy sources of pest control. and. First of all, I've learned that uh, editors in New York do not understand working in a garden, number one. And they don't, they don't often believe everything I'm telling them. So I told them that I use half grapefruits that I put around in shady areas of the garden. They've, the grapefruits that we'd eaten in the morning, we put out in the evening. And that in the morning when I pick them up, this is how they look. So. She didn't, Ruth didn't believe me. And this was sent to me by an eight year old girl who used my book, Root Shoots, Buckets and Boots and was catching her slugs exactly the way I said to do it. So there are so many alternatives to using poisons. I will say that I was doing a lot of research on snails in the garden and I, you have snails, right? Shake your head if you have snails. And I've learned that jays and a lot of other birds use those if you see those snail shells in your garden and empty, those are eaten by birds just as they're beginning to nest. They need that calcium. So it's, it's amazing how mother nature has uh, a destination for all of these oddball things. Um, if you know, if you've read trial and error or used any of the remedies, you know that I use chamomile tea. I use uh, systemic acquired resistance from Uncoated 325 milligram bare aspirin. I, you can't use the coated ones, they just don't work. And it's a fungicide and it's a, um, it, it stops mildew, it stops black spot. So um, it's a easy thing to do. And you do, again, you don't do that spray. Do you have somebody else? Yeah. Somebody else has a question and how that you, is- How do you dispose of slugs? How do you dispose of slugs? I go out every morning with this big spoon and with a bucket of soapy water, I use, um, what is that that I use? I use real soap. I don't use Dawn detergent or anything like that. I use soap and I go out with soapy water and I put the slugs in that and they disappear into the soapy water. And then when I'm done and I drain off the water, I give it to the worms. The worms will eat the, the dead slugs. It's just an amazing circle. How, do I, how can I burn my compost in Tampa, Florida area? How can I burn my compost in the? Hot. How can I burn my compost in the Tampa, Florida area? People actually do it in their homes. Um, you can burn my compost if you have a shady area. I know it's hot in Tampa. I know it's very hot, and you can burn my compost if you can do a covered area in a shady spot. And um, you know, even people who are in, say, Michigan or somewhere with deep snow, Maine can vermicompost if you have an open bot, if you have a uh, open, like my uh, plan that I have for the uh, block vermicomposting bin, if the, what the, what the worms do when it's too darn hot or it's too darn cold is they go down into the soil where it's always the same temperature. So you can vermicompost in, Tam in, in Tampa, Florida, and, but you just have to be sure you don't get pests in there. And you can write to me, Sharon, at SharonLovejoy.com, and I'll answer your questions happily. 
So let's go into a garden and look at a happy, healthy garden done by a wonderful organic gardener. I almost can't talk to people who are organic gardeners. I just don't understand it. It's all about the teamwork. It's all about diversity. The more, the more diversity you have in the garden and the more natives you have in the garden, the healthier your garden will be. The moment one gives close attention to anything, even a blade of grass, it becomes a mysterious, awesome, indescribably magnificent world in itself. And that, believe it or not, was written by Henry Miller, king of porn in some ways. But really, it's what um, Walt Whitman said all through the leaves of grass. If you pay attention, you'll be amazed. You'll be humbled. You'll be engaged. You'll be full of wonder. So I had an aunt. I, well, I had a cousin, Margaret, and she was old as an aunt, but she was my second cousin. And she said, if you want to live and thrive, let the spider run alive. And I've learned, um, I put empty pots throughout the garden upside down for homes for the spiders. And I have boxes for the spiders and I have little twig teepees for the spiders because they do 80 to 90% of the biological control of your garden pests. So let them do their thing. They're the best thing you could ask for in your garden. And I, you know, some of you who know me know that I'm just big on sphinx moths and clear wing moths and things like that. And a lot of people, I know I can look out there at your little mugs and I know some of you feed those to your chickens or you put them in your, uh, you, you know, you destroy them some way, but they turn in, and that's one that I'm actually, that I actually rescued. Um, they turn into the most indescribably beautiful moths that you could ever imagine. And according to Dr. Muse, who used to teach at Cornell, they can pollinate 200 flowers in less than seven minutes. And I did make a mistake when I said in my, in my video that I'm going to show you next thing up, they can pollinate 200 flowers, but not 200 plants. They do it in a contained area. Let me show you this. This is the proboscis. I wish I could use my laser pointer, but you can see the proboscis or what some people call the tongue of the sphinx moth. The longer the tongue, the more flowers it can get into. For instance, you have about seven or eight species of native bumblebees in Texas. Well, the longer the tongue of the bumblebee, the more flowers it can pollinate, unless it's robbing, nectar robbing. So let me go, what? The sound might be loud. Okay, be, protect your ears because the sound may be loud on the video. So I just want you to be aware of that. One of my favorite things in the world. Pink lined sphinx moth, a Hylis lineata. One of the best pollinators in the garden, 200 plants in seven minutes. Look at them. His or her proboscis is about one and a half times the length of her body. How could you not love that? <laughs> so what I do when I get sphinx moths, besides jump up and down with joy, and that's the great thing about being an organic gardener, you can be a kid at heart forever. What I do is I move them all to one plant and they can really defoliate a plant quickly, cover it with cheesecloth or with cheap um, toil that I get from the, from the fabric store. I use that a lot for crop covers and everything. I use it for covering fruit trees because I don't want to get birds caught in those horrible fruit tree covered nets. I've, I've rescued birds from those. So I cover my plant and I put the sphinx moths in there. They feed voraciously and then they drop into the ground and they pupate in the ground. Now I want to talk to you about one of my all time, of course, I just said that the um, sphinx moth was one of my favorite things, but believe me, I love our native bumblebees. They get short shrift. People don't realize how valuable they are. We have, I think we used to have 55 species and I think it's down to 47 or 49 species. And uh, I'm, they are endangered. Quite a few of them are endangered, loss of habitat, poisons, um, things like that. So I, I worked with the USDA ARS bee biology uh, station, learning about mason bees and, and moths. And I realized that so many of our things are pollinated by these guys. And these bumblebees are 
sonication pollinators or buzz pollinators. So now watch your ears because I'm going to do a video, but I want you to watch what they're doing. And I call the bump, it's the bumblebee rumba. They grab the anthers of a plant and, a, and the pollen, when they start shaking, the pollen explodes all over them and coats their fur. And I'm going to tell you a little bit, something else about the bumblebee too. Whoops. How do I go back? Because the bumblebee didn't rumba. Hold on, Jeff's going to get me back here. You're my very first Zoom, so this is uh, a good learning experience. So they have corbicular pouches or um, pollen baskets like, like the introduced honeybees have, but they, they move around from plant to plant because there's their corbicular pouch. They move around from plant to plant um, and they're very good at transferring pollen because of their furry bodies. And also they can go out way earlier than an introduced honeybee can. They can go out in 50, 55 degree weather because they're wearing a fur coat. And if you read any of the writing of Bernd Heinrich, the famous naturalist, he's an incredible uh, naturalist. He wrote uh, Bumblebee Economics. And you learn that they shake their bodies and uh, flex their muscles, their thoracic muscles and things to warm their bodies up. And so they're out there pollinating your fruit crops, your cranberries, your uh, fruit trees, your early bloomers long before honeybees can. Um, and here's another thing about bumblebees with their, with their fur. You, have you ever rubbed your hair or brushed your hair and had it stand out with static? Well, bumblebees have a positive electrical charge and plants on a clear day especially have a negative electric charge, electrical charge. So as a bumblebee gets close to the plant, the pollen literally jumps off of some plants and onto the bumblebee and then it uses its tarsi to groom itself and move that pollen back to that corbicular pouch that you see in that photo there. So um, now scientists, especially, uh, I think her name's Heather Whitney. She's a botanist and she's studying the fact that there might be another thing going on in that electrical charge and that negative and positive electrical charge. And that is that the plant's electrical charge changes when the honeybee gets, when the bumblebee gets close to it. It doesn't even need to touch it. It goes up a millivolt or two. And when the bumblebee finishes eating, the charge goes down. And that's a signal to other bumblebees that go, are going past that bloom that it just got depleted, give it a few minutes and it'll be back in business. So we don't even know half of the miracles, a, a trillionth of the miracles going on in nature. And that's why it is so important for us to save every species and keep the diversification and uh, alive, viable. Um, I talked a little bit about the USDA ARS Bee Biology Lab, and from them I learned about doing uh, and what the red, what the red arrows pointing to are some uh, bee houses, mason bee houses that Jeff made for me, and I will tell you that you do need to have open, unmulched ground, mud and soil for them to do their job. And let's look at a close up. This is the holes. This is one of the ones that Jeff built. They're 5 16th of an inch wide. They're three inches deep because that's what the bees need for laying their, their eggs. And the holes are about three quarters of an inch apart. And here's the interesting thing. They, the females lay the female eggs at the back of the hole. So that if a woodpecker's going in or a bird, another bird, well, they'll get the males first. Sorry, boys, but I guess we're indispensable. Here's a great, uh, a great thing to contact if you're interested in home, or home orchards. And I, I treasure the things that I grow in my home, home orchard. It's a lot, sometimes work, but wow, it's fabulous. So it's the homeorchardsociety.org. Contact them with questions and get on their site because they're just fantastic. But you're looking in at the actual growth inside that Mason Bees, um, 
walled off. And they're called mason bees because you can see how they have, um, they have, uh, they, they swoop down to the ground, they pick up soil in their mandibles and they build mason, masonry walls for their young. It's amazing. I know many of you don't like wasps and I personally was stung 22 times uh, on my back. So, but think about this before you start spraying for cabbage loopers. They can capture 2000 of them a day, 2000. And I didn't believe that. And I was working in my studio and I had a perfect view of uh, a wasp nest and a patch of kale and broccoli and some other things that were pretty heavily infested. And I just watched time after time after time as they picked up the cabbage loopers and put them into their larval holes to feed their young. Amazing. And they're good, they're incidental pollinators. They're not really important the way a bumblebee is or some of the other things, but they are incidental. I can't I can't tell you how much I loved Lady Bird Johnson and what she did for Texas, what she did for the whole world. Uh, between Lady Bird Johnson and the and her wildlife, her wildflower center in the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, it made a believer out of me for native plants. And this is native ceanothus. And when you plant native plants, you will find that your garden is alive with so many things you didn't even know existed. I mean, one oak tree can have 5,000 different insects on it. You can have, I learned when I was writing a chapter for the Brooklyn Botanic Garden for a butterfly book, and I was doing all kinds of experiments, and I learned that the smaller the flower, the smaller the native bee that would come to it, and the smaller the butterfly. So I did this kind of a layer cake approach to planting natives, tiny, tiny flowers, and bigger, then a little bigger, and a little bigger, and you could just chart all the different butterflies and, 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 uh, moths and, and bees that come to it. And you know, you in Texas, your show offs, you've got what, um, about a little less than 400 different butterflies, but you have about 10 times that number of moths. And moths are incredible. They're bird food for one thing, they're pollinators for another, they're bat food, just incredible. Do you have any questions? And feel free to ask a question because Jeff's monitoring that for me. And again, uh, this is manzanita. And I found so many species of birds that would feed on the manzanita and so many species of insects. You attract thrushes galore, you attract cedar waxwings, bohemian waxwings, cardinals, pyroluxias, all sorts of things. So Go to the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. Go to your other nurseries, which you've mentioned. Go to John Dromgul's fabulous nursery and pick up some native plants. It'll expand your horizon. And read Doug Tallamy's book. Um, oh, shoot. I know the name of it. I've read it two times. Uh, Doug Tallamy, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y. And I know my husband, so he's probably going to look it up. I know the name of the book, and I, I'm just bad. Bringing nature home. Bringing nature home. It's a great book. It's a fabulous book. So read that. I was doing a, a group of tree poems and I found you know, that our native willows, our native oaks, our native black walnuts, our native pecans, these all attract thousands of species of bugs. And these are so good for our environment. When you have a garden that spans the seasons and blooms as long as possible, seven, eight, nine months, and you plant larval host plants, you'll get things that look like this piece of, it looks like a piece of jewelry to me, uh, a piece of cloisonne. And this is a swallowtail caterpillar. This is its larva, and this is on fennel. I'm, I'm a bigger gardener. So even though I love growing uh, edibles, I, I, I have to have herbs and they do love fennel. I love their, their thread that they have saddling them onto the fennel. It looks like a dog head to me. And then you get these incredible winged visitors to your garden. I think when I was at John Durham Gould's, I did a program there maybe 10 years ago, his butterfly garden, if you get a chance, go to the natural gardener and his butterfly garden is just alive with butterflies. It's incredible. And of course you have to plant, you must plant native 
milkweed because you will get such a show going on all the time. Um, this is the last instar of this caterpillar. It was big, it was as big as my thumb. Just watching their life, you know, as it unfolds, watching the chrysalis, which is one of the most beautiful things in the world. And just having all sorts of blooms for these things. It's just an amazing, amazing experience. When you have native trees and plants and you have a healthy garden and you don't use poisons as I don't, you're gonna get all kinds of things that most people don't normally get in their gardens because they're out looking for the bugs. And, you know, some people think the only good bug is a dead bug, but you all know if you're organic gardeners that we've got things generalists like spine soldier bugs and praying mantis, which by the way, will eat good bugs and bad bugs. Um, but you're going to have all these things. And you're also going to have all these birds that'll be visiting you and other things like bats and mammals. One of my favorite favorite garden visit visitors is the green lacewing. If you look at them at night, if you go outside, in fact, I urge you to go out into your garden during growing season because you'll be stunned by the eyes staring back at you from spiders, from lacewings, from just from everything. It's just amazing. These guys have golden orange eyes that are incredible. But what's really neat about them is they like borage and I think it's the spiny hairy leaves on the borage or the hairy needles on the borage and they they lay their um, eggs on the borage and they have these aphid lions and these aphid lions are incredible predators in the garden they eat more than um, probably than most things do. They eat more aphids and they eat midges and they eat all sorts of things. So if you see something like this about this long in your garden, you know, remember, stop, look, make sure that you're not killing something that's a benefit to you and a benefit to your garden and a benefit to the earth. And again, you can see the, the hairs on here because many things like laying your eggs on that blue borage and Ladybird beetles, which we all know, we know they're ladybugs. The neat thing about them is they're aphid wolf. And that's the larva of a ladybird beetle. I called it a pumpkin bug when I was a kid. And I used to capture them and play with them and everything. And I'm gonna show you a video. So hold your ears in case it's loud. But it was, I was, it was this August and I was out working in my garden. And I was looking to see how the monarch butterflies were doing on this, um, uh, Asclepius fascicularis, which is a native California, uh, I don't like the tropical uh, butterfly weed. And so this native plant, listen to what I share with you. When you plant native plants, you get such diversity in your garden. First, let me introduce you to a ladybird beetle who just hatched, AKA ladybug, but they're ladybird beetles, just hatched. And then just quite close to me, this is the pupa of a ladybird beetle and it'll hatch in a few days. So if you see something like this on one of your plants, don't do anything to hurt it. And on this uh, milkweed, I have three or four baby monarch caterpillars. So it's, it's a, just a fountain of life. Happy day. Uh, Jeff has some questions for me. So what? What are your thoughts about using BT? What are your thoughts about using BT? Mm, bacillus. I don't use it, and I'll tell you why. If it kills the bad ones, it kills the good ones. And I've seen such a loss of, of butterflies in, uh, we travel the United States every year, we drive. And in Iowa and in Kansas and places like that, I just don't use it. I don't use it. Does that answer the question? I, you know, I, I'm, that's my prejudice. I just don't like it. And I don't like, um, I don't, I don't use neem oil. I use my own things that I make. And if I can't put it on my tongue and not have it burn me or put it on my skin and not have it burn me, I don't want it on my plants and I don't want it in my soil and I don't want it contaminating my soil. So what else? Uh, just somebody made a comment. I volunteer with the Wildflower Center team of Zoom cart members. Uh, I love using their database. Can I read that? Um, this is a wonderful email from, or a, a chat from Ed. 
I volunteer with a Wildflower Center team of bloom cart members. I love using their database when searching for plants. Um, Ed, I use it too. I love it too. It's just incredible. And you can learn uh, the beneficial insects that are around a plant. You can learn the larval host plants. You can, it's just incredible. You got an incredible group of people there that are great gardeners and some resources that are enviable. So many of you know what a flower fly is. You do, don't you? Um, you see them a lot of, I've seen people swatting at them. People think that they're bees, but bees have four wings and flies have two wings. And if you've ever sat and watched these, and I urge you to sit in your garden and observe things. You'll learn more from doing that than you'll ever learn from any book. But if you look and you see something that looks like it's hanging down on a string and just kind of moving back and forth, that's a flower fly. And they are so wonderful. There are many species of flower flies. So you'll see them in all different sizes, and just as there are many species of bees. Um, but the thing about them that I really love is those flower flies are flying around your garden and you may have an outbreak. I had a horrible outbreak of yellow aphids because of my um, native milkweed. And the flower fly finds these patches of massive patches of aphids, which the ladybird beetles and the um, aphid lions also were working on. The flower fly flies right into the middle of a patch of aphids, deposits its eggs, and soon, within a matter of days, the eggs hatch and they've got their meal right there. It's like a to-go meal for them. But the neat thing to do is to watch them. I call it the swinging elephant dance because when you watch um, uh, one of these larvae in, in an aphid patch, they just sort of swing. And then if they brush an aphid, it's gone. They eat it. It's just amazing. They are very good predators in the garden. A lot of people, I've seen them stomping on ground beetles and they're out there getting larvae of things that you don't want in your garden and preserve them, take good care of them. I'm a big lizard fiend. Now, I hope this isn't too long for you, but I love it when they're thermoregulating their body. So let's watch them do their push-ups. It's hot today, really hot. And this beautiful, beautiful lizard. Look at the blue on his back. Such a pretty guy. Slept. And doing his push-ups. Whoops. Now he's a lounge lizard. He's on my uh, lounge. Watch him doing his push-ups. It's pretty awesome. He's thermal regulating. Ah, oh, I love it. Hey there, you're pretty cute. Horny, but I can't help it. Um, so you have lizards in, in Texas and we have many lizards and you know that they're beneficial to the garden. But what they found at the Cal Academy of Science is that a tick that sucks the blood of this lizard is cleansed of Borrelia, which is a tick, tick bite disease. So, you know, we need to find out about that. When we talk about saving uh, the Amazon and other forests, we also have to save the diversity in the United States because there are unopened chapters that we've never even imagined, like a tick that sucks the blood of this lizard is cleansed. It's amazing. A lot of people do not like um, moles. I adore them. Um, they, yes, they do make tunnels in your garden, but they, that also aerates the soil. It allows water to penetrate. It provides a home for other things. So I say, give moles a chance. This is about a minute long. Uh, I, I guess if I were to tell you to invest in one thing in your garden that's structural, I would say fountains and running water are the most important thing you can have and ponds. Um, but I, you know, a fountain and running water is doable for everyone. At Wild Birds Unlimited, I got a dripper for my bird bath, which immediately increased the, the visits by birds by 60%. But watch this. This is just a little bubbler. And this is a newly uh, fledged Anna hummingbirds. You saw them at the beginning of my talk when I showed you the, the nest that was crammed with hummingbirds. You, they'll let you get right up next to them. And if you look closely, you see that they're totally... I was pretty excited. 
So invest, you don't need a big, huge Niagara Falls fountain. What you need is something that dribbles and you'll get uh, bumblebees here drinking, you'll get uh, wasps, that's life. you'll get uh, butterflies down at the bottom. You just would be amazed at what one little trickle on a fountain can bring into your garden. So much life. Oh, I just got a question. Is that better than a bird bath? I, I have to say, whoops, sorry about that. I have to say that, yeah, give it a little movement to your water, have a little spray, and you'll have, in Texas especially, you're going to get 10 and 12 hummingbirds at a time at a fountain where a bird bath really doesn't, I mean, it'll get an occasional hummingbird, but it's not an important water source for them. They want a moving water. They want a thin spray. And look at how long this has been here. I just love this. <laughs> It's terrible. I'm a, my own best audience here. I love this guy. So yeah, don't, you know, I think a bird bath is a wonderful thing. You'll get big birds at it. You'll get quail. You'll get um, jays, crows. And I have, a, I have a huge fountain. You can see how small that is. I have a huge fountain and it bring, and I get red-shouldered hawks, crows, ravens, things like that at my huge fountain. But the little fountain, I get bush tits, I get a tit mouse, I get, I get just wonderful things. So invest in, in something that's moving water. And if you can do a pond, I dug a pond in Cambria. Is this our pond? Mm -hmm. And it took me probably 10 months to dig it. Every day, I, I just have this vision that every day I went out in my nightgown. So you know I don't wear my nightgown more than one day. And I dug maybe 20 or 30 shovelfuls of soil out. I ended up building a great mound. I did hire someone to bring in large stones. I couldn't handle the stones. And it, to me, the most amazing thing was that the very first day that we filled a pond, we wanted it to fill and for the, the, you know, the horrible chlorine to work its way out. The very first day this dragonfly arrived and sat on the edge of a handle of my uh, green watering bucket. And I couldn't believe it. We'd never had a dragonfly. And soon it, at night, we started hearing this. A mile and a half from the closest street wall. lived a mile and a half from the closest water. How did they find us that quickly? I don't know. But I will tell you that my neighbor called and complained that it went from being a nice neighborhood to being a noisy neighborhood. Some people don't like toads, but you know, imagine that the toads can, can consume up to 10,000 insects in a season. Toads are so beloved by Celia Thaxter, who wrote the best garden book I've ever read in my life. It's called An Island Garden. It was written in 1894. She lived on Appledore Island. It's a main island, though New Hampshire tries to claim it, but it's a main island. And she used to hire kids on the mainland because she had horrible pests. She had slugs. She had all centipedes. She had everything. She'd hire kids uh, to catch toads for her to put in her garden. And they do balance out a garden, and they are great predators. I told you that I hope that you'll go out daytime and nighttime, just as a sunflower attracts butterflies during the day. If you go out at night with a flashlight, you'll see that it attracts many, many moths when it's in flower. And of course, then it also attracts bats, which we're, we depend on. You have a question? Um, how do you control mosquito larvae in a pond? How do you control mosquito larvae in a pond? I have, uh, I, I have gambusia. And um, gambusia, I think a lot of the mosquito control districts give them out, but you can buy them. They're, they look like a guppy, sort of. And that keeps them in, in the thing I have problems with mosquitoes with are my crocs of water. I have to be really, really careful. So, um, you know, use gambusia. But also be aware that um, they should be small gambusia, not mature ones, because 
you don't want to eat your have them eat your tadpoles so so when you have go out to the garden promise me that in the spring you'll go out to the garden and you'll check out those blooms at night i'm just i was at uh, boulder utah not boulder colorado but boulder utah this summer and I boulder lodge and saw literally hundreds and hundreds of bats of different species of bats. Jeff and I have a, what's called a bat detector and we go out at night with our sonar bat detector and you can tell the size of the bat and where it is by the sound of the, the sonar that it's emitting. It's really a neat thing to do with children. Oh, that, I all, know. These, yeah, all these things are good to do with children. Okay. This causes, sometimes people run out of the uh, out of the audience when they see, uh, this is our garter snake in Maine, and I just love it. And we have gopher snakes here, and we have king snakes, which we love. Now, I know that you're in Texas, and I know that you have a wealth of snakes, but I want you to look on the uh, upper left side at a beautiful and beneficial milk snake, but stay away from those other ones, okay? Because you've got copperheads, and you've got rattlesnakes, and somebody said to me, well, Sharon, all you have to do is look for the cat eyes on, um, all you, I think somebody needs to be muted. Um, all you have to do is look for the cat eyes on a snake, but you don't want to get close to them because I got close to a rattler and it was at me like that. So be careful. And also know that that bright snake that looks like a coral snake is a beneficial snake and they're eating rodents in your garden. My uncle Willie had a 3000 acre ranch in Arizona and he depended on his peacocks to keep them alerted when there were rattlesnakes around. They just screamed and maybe a chicken would do that. I don't know. Somebody let me know. So these are often maligned and I love the underdogs. I mean, if I were to go to, a, to uh, the Humane Society, I'd come home with 9,000 underdogs, probably the ugliest dogs ever in the earth, but I love them. And I love, this is old Milky Eye and he was my tame squirrel in Cambria. And squirrels, and jays are the two foresters. They plant 50,000 acorns, 100,000, a million acorns a year. Um, they're just doing research in Britain on what on they call them their gatherers, their, their jays. They did hunt them. Um, yes, jays will take an occasional nestling. That's nature's way. I can stand a jay taking a nestling because that is nature's way. But uh, we have to also recognize that they plant millions of oak trees a year. And what they found in Britain, and it's so amazing to me, is that jays, there are certain birds like um, acorn woodpeckers that, that have a granary larder in one place. And then there are other birds that have granaries all over. And then there are chickadees that have hidden stores of things all over. And they remember where they are. Well, the jays plant these things and then go back to them in early spring. And they pick off the cotyledons, those soft, pliable cotyledons. And they actually feed them to their young. It's the only time that they feed them to their young. They can't do old leaves. They can only do the cotyledons. So it's almost like they're farmers. They're not just foresters. They're farmers. So it's always an amazement to me that I can look at something like this. And those were the acorns of this tree in Tallahassee, Florida. Amazing. Think of the 5,000 species of insects and all the species of birds that depend on this and live in this. I, you know, I always worry about birds because I, I love cats, but I know that cats that are feral or cats that are let to roam outside can kill many billions of birds, millions of birds a year. And just think of this, chickadees in Michigan destroy 8 billion insects annually. So everything has its value, everything has its place. I had a man who wrote me a really nasty letter where I can't remember his name. He was, he ended up becoming my friend, uh, sort of, and he knocked his Phoebe nests down every year because they were dirty, he said, but they consume so many of the garden pests. It's not even, it's amazing to watch them in action. So be a little patient if they build their mud nest on their house and you've got poop to clean up because it'll be worth it in the long run. I think maybe crows are the ones that get the worst rap of um, anybody because of their love of corn, but they can consume 40,000 agricultural pests as they feed their young, as they're feeding their fledglings. It's amazing. 
and I had friends who just said that barn owls were gross and scary and they didn't like them, but they, when they're feeding their young, especially they can feed up to 1400 rodents per clutch. So that's an amazing attack on rodents in the garden. So I've been talking a long time. I probably talk to you too much, but I get excited, especially when I talk to people like you. Every morning I read a book by Virgil was written in the 1200s. And one of my favorite quotes from him, but uh, besides how to make the crops joyous is, and let no spot of idle earth be found, but cultivate the genius of the ground. I try to plant every inch of my ground. I'm cultivating the genius of the ground. And I hope you do too. Carpe terra, everyone, go for it. <laughs> And I hope you have questions. Do you have any questions? So um, raise your hand up, I guess, uh, or do you have a question? Uh, somebody wrote to say that you can buy Gambusia from Aqua Dome. That must be in Austin. Is that correct? Yeah, that was me. Um, I, okay. It's down on Ben White. Um, I have a lot of small ponds, and the toads come and eat the Gambusia, and I have to replace them. <laughs> That's all right. We want to keep the toads happy, right? You, at least. And they're, they're four for a dollar. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, you can afford that. I'll loan you the dollar if you need it. But yeah, I, I have shallow ponds and, and saucer ponds and things like I don't have a deep one. Um, I've really had a problem with um, raccoons. And I did what the um, American uh, Humane Society said, which is put a low voltage wire low to the ground the way that raccoons drag themselves over the ground, you know, uh, it doesn't hurt them, but it shocks them and they know not to come back. So if you're having uh, raccoon problems, that's that's one thing you can do. And it only is uh, comes on at night, so. I have a huge problem with snails in, um, in the spring. And, 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 the, and we're talking, we're not talking a couple, we're talking thousands. And I've gotten to where I just don't plant certain things in the spring, but I pick them up and throw them to the chickens and that sort of thing. But it's just I think that's, really are. that's good. But remember also that there, the birds also love that calcium that's in the snail shells. So if you can, you know, just drop them in soapy waters. I put boards out. I, I'm going to say this and knock on wood. I don't have a single, okay. I'll, I'll be plagued tomorrow. I have not seen a snail on our property in two years. My son got a salad from some restaurant and there was a snail in it. And as he was throwing it out in the garden, I was saying, no, <laughs> I don't have snails. We just, we have slugs, but we do not have snails. But so wait a minute. The follow up to um, the man who asked about the bird baths. Somebody said that you can get inexpensive solar power floating. Yes. Uh, fountains for bird baths. Yeah, it's true. Uh, was it Ed? Was, uh, who's that from, Ed? Uh, Steve. Steve. Yeah, the bird baths. Karen Marks from Austin. Karen, Karen Marks from Austin reminded me, and I should have mentioned this, I love those floating solar, you know, fountains that can float in a pond or they can float in a big crock of water or they can float uh, in a bird bath and they have a little little spray, a little fountain and the hummingbirds love those. So, and they're not expensive. They're maybe $25 maximum. So put it in a sunny spot and you'll have your hummingbirds dancing for you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Wait uh, a minute. Uh, what was the raccoon advice? Well, the American uh, Humane Society recommended to me in a humane way that you get a, um, a night, it only comes on at night, solar powered um, wire, one wire, about, I think I have all the dimensions in trial and error, maybe six inches from the ground because the raccoons tend to amble low along the ground. So once they touch it and they get a slight shock, they know, and it's not gonna kill them or anything. It's a, a slight shock. That's what it is. What? Okay, Trudy's throwing you a curveball here. Uh oh, Trudy's throwing me a curveball. I better get my catcher's mitt on. I have armadillos who like to dig up my vegetable garden. How to discourage them? Trudy, you, Trudy has armadillos. <laughs> Trudy, I think you get the the award. 
because in my whole life, even though I taught at Round Top and things like that in Texas, nobody's ever talked to me about armadillos, which of course are adorable, but are pain and also carry leprosy. So that, that keeps them off my lap. Um, you have to do what you do for a woodchuck, which is uh, wire screens or wire fencing that comes down in an L. And I show that, I'm sure you can get a copy of trial and error at your library. It comes down in an L and it goes out about three feet because you wanna keep them from, you surround, you're gonna to have to surround your edibles from uh, predation by the armadillos. <laughs> that was a good curveball. But the only thing you can do is exclude them. There's nothing else you can do but exclude them. Rats. Oh boy, rats, I'm sorry. You know, I love animals, but did you really say rats or did somebody no, write somebody. that? Okay, I, I have rats because I have 50 feet of grapes and I have figs and I have every fruit that a rat loves. And so Jeff talked to a vineyard specialist. I'm sorry, I don't like killing things and I don't do it. So I'm gonna let Jeff talk to you. Jeff, you talk to him. <laughs> I got tired of spending money on um, snap traps and I spent $50 on one of those electronic uh, rat zappers um, and they do the, do the trick. They, uh, uh, it says they're only for indoors, but I use them outdoors under a covered porch and bait it with peanut butter. And then what I do is when I catch a rat, I'll... Uh, <laughs> God. I'll, I'll uh, throw it out in our yard or in our walkway somewhere uh, at night and then in the morning it's gone and then I, I was kind of puzzled why they're you know do they come, come back, back to life <laughs> but um, raccoons like to eat dead rats so I just figured that I'm curing one problem in recycling and then the other question how do you deal with grasshoppers that want to eat everything. Yeah, how do you do with deal with grasshoppers? I'll give you uh, what I what I learned from the Amish. Um, they use because they don't use pest. Some of them may. I'm not going to say they don't use pesticides. But I was working at the Lehigh Valley Historical Gardens and Museum, and the Amish have good luck on a moist morning. They put out. They shake. Use a a sifter uh, with all purpose white flour and they put it on things. And they said that, um, you know, the grasshoppers feed on it and it cakes on them and it cro they croak. So I don't have a grasshopper problem. I have snowy tree crickets, which I love, but I don't have grasshoppers. So I did have something eating things and I did use uh, flour on the, the plants and it did work for me. So try that. Pretty good active group. I love it. <laughs> we just love your alternatives to, you know, living in harmony. It's it's amazing. Well, let's just say I live in harmony with everything but the rats, and that I let Jeff step in and take care of. There's nothing more gross than having working on a crop for a year and then seeing a rat bite out of the perfect. And, and they go right for the right things too. And I, I don't love them. Our kids wanted to see Ratatouille when it came out and Jeff said, I am not going to see a rat movie. I got enough rats in my life. <laughs> Any other question? No, Looks like we did all the questions. Uh, it says, will flower harm other beneficials? Usually the kind of, uh, I, I can't imagine that they, because they'd be out probably eating small critters, not eating the plants. The beneficials aren't eating the plants. The, the grasshoppers are eating the plants and crickets eat the plants, but the beneficials don't. And you can just always, I'm very careful to check before I shake anything on or spray anything on or even spray things off with water. I always say spray it off with water first. Well, you don't want to spray off baby uh, aphid lions or something like that. Sharon, I have a question and I didn't know how to share it to everyone. But okay. how do you keep squirrels? Every time I plant seed in my um, flower, my box my planter squirrels come along and just start digging holes everywhere you know it's really amazing because they are able scientists believe that they can smell 
the scent of freshly turned earth. And I agree with oh, you. Yeah. You know, I what I use are, because um, I plant mini bulbs and things like that. And I plant them in, in flower boxes and planters. And you know, those uh, green plastic uh, uh, baskets that you get, can you get one off on my, uh, off my workbench? Yeah, don't kill yourself going out there though, it's dark. Jeff's gonna bring one in. I cover things with tents of that, of, of a nylon screening that I put over, um, I make little mini tents for things. And mm -hmm. I also, because it's horrible, you, you're gonna lose everything, you know, cause it's squirrels know when you plant something. And I also use, um, I hate to admit it, but I go to the dollar store and I get those, those kind of like a tent that goes over things and I put those wow. over them because they're a dollar oh, each. Yeah. yeah. They're a dollar each and they really work. And um, you know, you have to you have to exclude them. It seems like once the soil is back in place and it's a, a week old, they're not as interested. But I I have to keep we have ground squirrels and they do just as much damage as tree squirrels do. And uh, but I do urge you if you get anything at farmers market or um, at, and poor Jeff, he's disappeared into my garden. So we're looking for plastic, plastic bag to share with you. Um, if you uh, keep, you have to keep them protected, just like you have to do for armadillos. You know, you have to exclude them. So, and just imagine that we talk about having senses far beyond uh, what animals have, and yet we find out that animals have an electric charge that attracts pollen and that the plants know and that the plants have to reap you know it's just utterly amazing to me what we don't know about nature here i hear jeff coming in to share this with you so don't let him down yes well hold we on can. can you put uh, me on the screen i couldn't find any they're on my potting bench on the left left side in the center shelf never mind somebody else um have a question um, it, it, me it says what do, repeat what you buy at the dollar store i get um and i have pictures of them on um i wish i could show i have one of them actually jeff inside the um my potting shed on the left in the bucket is one of those dollar store tents and then on my workbench on the left side are my stacks of baskets so i get those stacks i get strawberries and tomatoes, although I grow strawberries and tomatoes, but I get those um, plastic wire baskets and I use those as cloches. And I, and I make cloches out of um, jelly jars and anything I can do to, to protect my things. So the Jeff's mm -hmm. getting my um, tent to show you in there. They don't have, they have them only in spring and summer at the dollar store. And, um, and, I, and I did want like to- a, a thing it, for putting, keep flies off your food exactly that's all it is that's all it is and they're so inexpensive um i will say you know not only do i have clay soil as you have clay soil but we only get 15 to 21 inches of rain a year you guys get a lot more rain than we do so i use all my water and bath water bath water shower water goes into the garden goes to the fruit trees it's gray water system um if you've ever read the book harvesting rainwater it's fabulous um, I think it came out of Arizona. Thank you. Can you see this? These are what I use for my plants that I put in my planter boxes. Well, strawberry things. Yeah, that's what I use. I save them. And then this is one of those fly food things, you know, and I use this for my new things that are being attacked by squirrels and by, by tree squirrels, by ground squirrels, by everything. It, it's a battle out there, but you can do it and you can do it in, in a nice way, unless it's a rat, of course, but. Mm. It says, how do you keep your bubbling water feature clean? Doesn't moss and algae grow? No, I, I rinse it. You mean the little ones or I, I rinse them every day and um, I use barley, little bales of barley in my big fountain floated in there. And that that's like a natural chlorine actually. And, and I give all this in what, 
Jeff has some questions yeah, that just came. Uh, maybe our, how do you keep your bubbling water? That's, the, yeah, that's, that's what we're talking about now. Oh, okay. So barley straw, it's really wonderful. But you know, the best thing to do is to clean it. And I, and I have five fountains and one of them is huge and we clean it all the time. And probably once a month, Jeff vacuums out the huge fountain and that water's green by that time. And the plants love it. They just thrive on that water. They love it. Um, it says picnic table covers work to pin them into the soil to keep them from blowing away. Good. Yeah. Anything you can do to exclude and you can get cheap, cheap, cheap nylon screening for windows. You can use that. And I use, I make hoops and have, have those as exclusionary tactics in this warfare that we have going on. Karen says she uses tool. There, I th actually, we made a video of her uh, with using pink tool. Uh, yeah, tool is what I use. And um, I use it because I do not recommend using those nets that people sell to cover fruit trees and things because birds get caught in them all the time. I use tool. Yeah, it's the best thing you can do. You can buy, it's 50, 50 inches wide too, so. And they said palp up mesh laundry bags from dollar store. Um, somebody started using a toilet brush to clean the fountain bowl basin or real bags. Uh, I, I have a wire. I have a wire bristle brush because sometimes it can get thick. But I think a toilet brush is a good idea uh, if you do it every day, especially. So. Um, and then uh, I mean, it just says old election sign frames are being taken down everywhere to use to frame it. Well, that's a good idea. You know it. We got to get rid of those things. That, we want that in the distant past, right? I love all your questions. You guys are fantastic. <laughs> we got an active group tonight. This is great. Yeah, it's pretty wonderful. <laughs> well, excellent. Um, I guess. Uh, yeah, and we love her responses too. That show the 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 joy and the 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 beauty that she shares with us out in the garden. Well, I think you all feel that too. So it's easy. You know, I'm not a checkbook gardener. I get my hands in the soil, and I believe in what's called earth therapy. You go out every morning and you say good morning to your garden, and you get your earth therapy. It's the best thing you can do. And I have my my um, dermatologist who said to me. You are really healthy. He said, I believe that people who garden are the healthiest people, except for all your skin cancers. That's true. But, you know, because we're bending and we're pulling and we're lifting and we're raking, we are healthier. And we're not going to a gym. We're keeping our garden happy and we're not checkbook gardeners. We're really doing our earth therapy, which is so great. Blah, blah. Man, <laughs> is that true or what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, who's this from? From Aaron, I garden before and after. Can you read that to me? In the winter, I wear a little headlamp. Oh, I love this. Aaron said, I garden before and after work, and in the winter, I wear a headlamp. And a headlamp, Aaron, is a good thing to use when you go out to look at your sunflowers and things that are in bloom because you'll see moths. Um, I use the red setting sometimes on my on my headlamp so that I don't scare things away. But yeah, that's great. I can just see you out there in, the, in your uh, with your headlamp on. That's terrific. That's a dedicated gardener. I like that. And um, age, uh, I'm sorry, Aaron's uh, video about the tool covering plants video link is in the chat if anybody wants okay. to. Thank you. Okay, good. Good. Jeff will do that for me too. I love we're like mycelium, you know, us, all of us, all of us who are organic gardeners, we're just like this huge mat and network of like minds going on above ground, but sharing what, things. What, what drugs are we doing? I don't know. We must be doing uh, psilocybin mushrooms. That's so organic. <laughs> things are vibrating. I can't figure out why. <laughs> You're a bad girl. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm just bored at home, you know. Oh, I'm not. Oh, or not no. bored, really, but yeah. No. Right. Well, I love being with all of you, and uh, what a hoot. And having my sister, and uh, having um, Kim, and, and Anne, and people I know, uh, and my friend Jeannie, who's my partner in crime, 
having all of you around, not to mention Jeff, my other partner in crime. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It was wonderful. Oh, we're so blessed to have you. Thank you so much. So good. See you Thank someday you. when I'm in Texas. Everybody unmute and say, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody in mute and say thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was really great. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Remember, remember your earth therapy, everyone. Okay. <laughs> it was great. Thank you. All right. Good job, everybody.